Uh, I don't mind. Um, my, I think my talk can go, can I either go first or second? It doesn't matter. So Luciana, maybe you can decide. Okay. I can, I can start. Okay. So let's okay. just, we'll give it a few minutes, Luciana, and then we'll okay. start. Um, I'm just, I'm going to start sharing my, my screen because I want to test because of. Okay. Let me just make a co-host. Okay, you should be able to now. Yeah, that looks good. And if you just put it into slide view, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's perfect. So just while we just wait for a few people to join, um, I'm just looking at the list here. Uh, there are a few people I don't know. Patrick. Um, Patrick, do you mind just telling us a bit about yourself? It's actually to help me understand our audience. Yes, good afternoon, good morning, good day to you all. I'm Patrick Samanua. I'm a general surgeon, professor of surgery, currently a global surgery fellow with UCT and vice chancellor at Uganda Matters University. Pleased to be oh. attending this talk. Thank you. That's lovely. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Patrick. And um, John Maria, I, I, I'm not sure if we've met or not. Do you mind just telling us a bit about yours? Oh. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Hi, I'm Sean. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm part of the MPH program doing global surgery elective module. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Sean, just, uh, just a quick bit about yourself. Yeah, so I am a medical doctor. I completed um, ComServ in a very rural hospital in our last year. Uh, currently enrolled in the MPH program, uh, more specifically the community eye health um, specialization. Oh, right, yes. In the future, we'd like to go into clinical ophthalmology, yeah. Okay, oh, very nice. Welcome. Thank you. Um, great, Christelle, are you happy for us to press on now? Bruce, that should be fine. I'm just sending another message to everyone to get more people to join, but I think we've okay. got a good view. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, it really is a pleasure and a privilege to be chairing today's meeting. Um, I've got two colleagues um, who I've had the fortune of working with. Um, Luciana uh, Stefani from uh, Brazil and Adam Yud Smith from Uganda. Um, the, the topic today is about uh, doing research in low middle income countries and about failure to rescue. And I would say both of these individuals are actually real experts in the field. So thank you for taking the time to join us. We're going to start with Luciana uh, with the first talk today. So Luciana is a professor in the surgical department at the hospital de clinicas de Porta of Grey, and Allegre. Sorry, Luciana, for messing up the name. Um, it's a quaternary center which serves about 4 million people in southern Brazil. Uh, she does a lot of medical education, simulation. She's also director of education of the education division. 
And then in 2015, she created a peer-optive research group. And they've been focusing on developing risk models uh, and identifying high-risk surgical patients and strategies to improve care. There's, there's some wonderful work they've done. And I would recommend people, you know, go and search her name uh, after the meeting. There's some really good work which has been published in the BJA, for example. If you get to those articles, you'll find some very interesting stuff on identification of high-risk patients and uh, on failure to rescue. Luciano also has been the co-lead for the Latin American Surgical Outcome Study, or LASOS, a massive project. And Luciano was just before we started was telling me that they've completed recruitment and they've got over 20,000 patients from Latin America. So that's going to be a really massive study, It'll be really interesting uh, information. So that's the background. So we'll start with Luciana. Thank you, Luciana. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce, for uh, the kind introduction and also for you all. And um, let me see. Are you seeing my screen already? No. Not yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, it just tested. Okay. Yes, it's coming up. Yes, that's good. Thanks, Luciana. Thank you. So uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's uh, uh, very nice to be here uh, as a representative of uh, Latin America uh, continent. And I want to share some of our experience doing research in Latin America. As Bruce said, I am an anesthesiologist and I'm working uh, for a couple of years with reoperative research. And uh, recently I, I started a, a um, great study, a collaborative study in Latin America. So uh, we have many challenges for doing research in Brazil as a low middle income country. Probably you uh, have also many uh, challenges as, as well. So it's very nice to share some of our uh, ideas and concerns. Uh, my city is Porto Alegre. Uh, it is located in South region of Brazil. Uh, we, we are not, uh, at, uh, we don't have uh, beaches around our city, but we are surrounded by a beautiful lake, Guaiba Lake, and we have the most beautiful sunset of Brazil. And this is my hospital. It's a university hospital, public hospital with more than 800 beds. Probably is the most important hospital of South region of Brazil. Recently, we increased our facilities and now we have 30 uh, surgical rooms. And we attend more than 3 million people around our city and yeah. small cities. Uh, uh, around the capital. Uh, some generalities about Latin America. Latin America is a, a huge continent. We have almost 600 million uh, people in Latin America, and it is a complex region. We have 33 countries and 14 territories with different systems of healthcare access to care, socioeconomic, geographical, environmental, cultural, and ethnic factors. It is a very, um, uh, we have many inequalities in our uh, continent. This is a picture of Brazil, of, uh, we call favela. It's a poor, uh, 
we can see uh, poor uh, houses uh, nearby a very fancy building and this uh, shows uh, uh, the huge inequality and we have this kind of picture in several uh, big cities in Brazil. Also Latin America, uh, we have many uh, different indigenous people, more than 800 different uh, peoples and they are, uh, they compound a great part of uh, people from some countries like Venezuela, Bolivia, Peru, and they are, uh, they are not included in public policies sometimes. They have, they have uh, bad uh, health uh, outcomes. So we need to look to this uh, group of people also. And uh, just for uh, illustration, uh, the simple uh, thing about the, the word popcorn uh, in uh, Spanish, we, we, each country has a, a way to say uh, popcorn. Venezuela, Cotufas, Ecuador, Canguil, Brazil is pipoca. So it's a simple word. And uh, even in uh, all countries speaking Spanish, uh, we say uh, in different ways. So this is a, an example of our cultural diversity. So Latin America countries have the most unequal income distribution in the world, which results in inequalities across the region and heterogeneity in every data from different sectors. So um, uh, we can uh, have some uh, list of things that contribute to the poor performance of Latin American countries in research, and also in other sectors of society. So insufficient budget for research seems to be at the core. And even if the, 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 we could increase the budget for, for research, research, it probably wouldn't be enough because of the size of economies of the countries uh, when we compare with the high income countries. And the social and, and economic inequalities lead to health inequality. So the, probably the most important problem is the lack of integration between the primary and to tertiary care. And we see in our area in uh, surgical assistance, people coming for surgery in the very advanced condition of disease. And this is a, a, a difference uh, probably in outcomes from our uh, continent from uh, high income countries. Also, we have political instabilities and frequent swings in economic strategies. We don't have a, um, a plan for uh, a long term plan for research and for other uh, uh, public policies in uh, healthcare. And also, cultural, difference, cultural differences, geographic isolation, and scarce cooperation between countries and also inside of each country. If we could uh, unify the Latin America countries, uh, we, we, we can see that the healthcare expenditure per capita is uh, uh, about $600 uh, uh, per capita per year. And we compare this uh, health expenditure with, with United Kingdom, for example, it's 4,000 uh, per capita. So it's a huge difference in health investments. So uh, the inequalities, uh, the social inequalities uh, leads to uh, health inequalities. In Brazil, we have two main uh, systems, the public and private system. And we also have this division in uh, the majority of countries uh, in Latin America. So this is an example of a private hospital at Sao Paulo, very um, fancy new hospital and a public emergency from the Northwest region of Brazil. And we can say that we have two systems and uh, even in Brazil, we are the only country with more than a hundred uh, million uh, people with universal health coverage. Everybody has uh, access to health uh, coverage. However, 25% of our population also uh, have uh, private insurance and access to private care. 
And the problem is that more than 50% of our health budget, the health expenditure, go to the this 25% of private sector. So this is a huge challenge that we have in Brazil. Uh, to understand a little more, the, when we uh, uh, look at the technologies, we have differences. So the public and the private system have a uh, difference. The MRI for uh, per million uh, inhabitants, we can see in um, developed countries, night, a number of 19 MRI per million. In Brazil, for example, 14, in uh, Suriname 3.7 and El Salvador 1. So we have a huge difference across uh, the counts of Latin America. But when we look at Brazil, we have uh, 17 machines per million in the private sector and only 2.5 machines in the public sector. So this is uh, to show the difference between the systems. And also uh, this uh, difference in, in technology and medications reflects in outcomes uh, differences. So we have many challenges uh, for uh, doing research in this kind of uh, uh, countries and with so in many inequalities. So we have uh, scarce resources for research. We have inadequate research capacity and inadequate infrastructure. Probably uh, uh, they are uh, linked to the weaker governance and uh, this leads to the brain drain problem. Uh, scientists go to the uh, high income countries and they don't come back to Brazil and to the to other countries of Latin America. And also we have a uh, difficult ethical process. We need to improve the ethical uh, approvals uh, for all kinds of research. And we have the lack of integration between information systems. When we look at the, the GDP uh, investment in research, we can see that only Brazil is, uh, has uh, more than 1% of its uh, GDP invested in, in research. And, but we are far from Finland and United States regarding investment in research. But all countries of Latin America invest less than 0.5 of uh, their GDP. When you look at the number of research per thousand people employed, also, we see that Argentina has the best numbers, but we are far from uh, the developed countries. Uh, we don't have, we don't prioritize to to the the scientific um, uh, side of society. So, um, and the research ethics systems in Latin America, they have different standards. The process of ethical review at several sites can be overwhelming, time consuming and costly. So this is, uh, uh, we have difficult process. For example, in Brazil we have, we need more than uh, six to one year to, to have an approval of a, a randomized clinical trial, for example. Recently, the Lancet Global Health uh, showed some indicators that we should follow regarding ethical systems. And we can see that just 13 countries from Latin America have legally binding instruments for health related research. Just 12 uh, have a national body responsible for the oversight of research at committees. And just seven have policies that support research at training. So um, this is an example for, for Brazil. We have at least four steps to have an approval for an observational or a randomized clinical trial. And we have a, a, a less level for approval for international trials or for uh, trials that involves uh, industry. So it's a, a kind of uh, a challenge to have an approval in Brazil. 
We also have challenges regarding digital information because we understand that to, to have good uh, research, we need good data, we need trustable data and electronic health systems in Latin America. Uh, we have just uh, less than 50% uh, of countries have some type of national electronic health register. Less than 30% have legislation that favors the utilization of health electronic records. And the problem is that each hospital can create uh, it, its own system and they keep the, the records on people. So there are silos of duplicated information within countries. And uh, frequently the data uh, are often uh, of poor quality. So it's uh, hard to make um, big data research in Brazil. We have a national uh, system uh, that uh, take care just for operational data and uh, each hospital can have uh, its uh, own system. Regarding impact of research, we can see uh, the cooperation is scarce in Latin America. Uh, in the last years, we, we saw uh, the increase of collaboration special uh, for international uh, collaboration, but uh, the collaboration between countries is still very uh, low and we need to increase. We see just 3.3% of the uh, research have collaboration between countries. So we can uh, summarize the challenges of uh, research in Latin America. Uh, in five uh, factors. Uh, the scientific developments are not used to solve society's problems. So the national priorities are unfocused. Scientists do not have a, a salary in accordance with their education. So grants are not easy to obtain. Inadequate research capacity. We have a lack of integration of information and exhausting ethical process and uh, scarce cooperation. And all of these uh, factors lead to difficult to publish in high impact journals. So there is a need to move forward beyond echoing the evidence-based medicine taken from other regions and populations and reproducing foreign uh, guidelines without generating our own research. Uh, recently at the British uh, Journal of Surgery, uh, uh, a group of researchers made a, a Delphi consensus about what we need to uh, address regarding preoperative research. And postoperative ward care was a priority for low middle income responders and also for high uh, income country responders. So this is a, 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 an important view that we need to look for uh, postoperative uh, ward care. This is a, a, a priority that's very clear to me because uh, we saw postoperative complications leading to postoperative mortality, and we need to improve the failure to rescue to uh, improve our outcomes. And we have um, many uh, clinical and surgical factors that are already mapped regarding <coughs> surgical outcomes, but we need to improve our understanding regarding the basal determinants of health, like social economic deprivation, ethnicity, tertiary care access. And also we need to understand uh, how hospital structure and the process of surgical patient care, how this uh, influence the, the, the outcomes. We are still uh, starting in to see the, 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 the big picture of uh, 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 postoperative outcomes. We have some uh, nice experience regarding collaborative research. As uh, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we started the last study, the Latin American Surgical Outcome Study, a seven day cohort study of patients undergoing surgery in uh, Latin American countries with the mentoring of Professor Rupert Pierce, also Professor Beaker helped us uh, in many uh, steps of this study. 
we involved many countries. We uh, our initial target was 25 countries, but we finalized our data collection with 15 countries, more than 22,000 patients, third, uh, 300 hospitals, and nine months of data collection. We uh, did not have any financial support to run the study, and we had high degree of collaboration uh, from uh, national leaderships and uh, local leaders from all hospitals across Latin America. I also have some experience regarding a high-risk surgical patient. And uh, it is um, interesting that we developed a risk model with just four variables. And we use this uh, risk model in several hospitals in Brazil. It is a model that we um, try to uh, identify the high-risk surgical patients. And we uh, also uh, included the high-risk surgical patients in a bundle of care, and we tested this bundle of care in our institution. And we had good results with intensification of care. And we have a um, reduction of mortality and failure to rescue probably uh, because of the increase in uh, rapid response teams and we increase the vigilance of these patients. This is a, an example that I wanna show you that was the first uh, collaborative research that we made regarding surgical uh, assistance in, in our hospital. And we included all uh, teams from nursing, uh, from the uh, ward care, from the recovery room, from the surgical team, anesthesia team, clinicians. So everybody was included in this as a very nice uh, uh, paper and people feel uh, participating in research. Now we are uh, finishing uh, a study where we worked with 10 uh, hospitals, with then a data bank from 10 hospitals to, uh, uh, to the, to, for the derivation and validation for a, uh, of a risk model, very similar for, with the first one that we developed. And uh, just to say that we, we have good results with these uh, data banks, but it was very, very difficult to collect this information uh, across the country. We started with 50 uh, country uh, hospitals and we ended the study with just 10 uh, hospitals because we have different uh, electronic medical records, lack of uniform information, two health system, public and private one, information about procedures with different codes in each hospital, information about uh, ASA not available in the majority of hospitals inadequate research capacity for a country like Brazil, it's, uh, it's clear for us. And it, it took to us three years to collect data banks. So it's, uh, we uh, uh, are facing uh, many challenges for this research. So we discussed many problems, but also we need uh, to discuss solutions. So probably the main solution is to uh, increase the importance of research. We need to direct actions from the government. We need to improve the investment research. We need education in healthcare and in scientific development, support to young researchers. Also, we need to build a stronger community of Latin American research. We need to increase the collaboration between countries and inside each country and engage citizens. This is very important. Uh, I think citizens' uh, population need to understand the importance of research. So uh, we uh, engage in this, the, the citizen. We can uh, start a culture of uh, scientific uh, research uh, in Latin America. So I truly believe that we can transform patient care, that research can be important for the society. If we search for the right answers, if we all take part, if we all contribute, and if we see research as important to our patients' outcomes as every other aspect uh, that we do for take care of them. Thank you so much for listening to me.
Thank you very much, uh, Luciana. I think, um, should we just open it to the floor just for like one or two questions and then we'll let um, Adam chat and then we'll have both of you respond to to questions. But if there are one or two uh, urgent questions, we can deal with those now. Okay, um, Luciana, a lot of what you spoke about um, resonated a lot with me. Um, I think you gave a great context to what it's like uh, working in Brazil and in Latin America. And also, um, I think there, there are a lot of challenges which you have, which are similar to us. So I'm sure they will be probably a lot of discussion at the end of the session, but I think let's let uh, Adam carry on and then we can have a little panel discussion afterwards. Thank you. Perfect. So, great. So now it's my um, pleasure to uh, introduce Adam. So Adam is a colleague from Uganda. He's a uh, anesthetist. Uh, he heads up the Department of Anesthetics at um, Mbali. Uh, Adam and I have worked together for quite a long time. Um, and Adam is one of the leaders in the um, NIHR Global Group for Perioperative and Critical Care. And Adam's expertise are in uh, data science and uh, I would like to say in failure to rescue. And Adam is uh, completing his PhD as well, um, which is in uh, essentially risk stratification and failure to rescue. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you join us, Adam. And I think Adam's going to be discussing failure to rescue today. Thanks, Adam. Uh, great. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks very much for the introduction um, and the invitation to, to talk today. Um, can I just check that you can see my slides? Yep, we can see them. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. So actually, I wanted to start, uh, I start with a little story. I wanted to tell you about Matthew. Uh, and Matthew is 26 years old, uh, came to hospital with a three-day history of uh, severe abdominal pain. That was gradually getting worse. He'd previously been fit and well. Um, and when he came to hospital, he was uh, very dehydrated uh, and had an acute abdomen. He was assessed by the surgical team and uh, it was felt that he needed to have a laparotomy uh, and he had peritonitis. So he was taken to theatre within a few hours, um, had his laparotomy. He actually had a gastric perforation, which was repaired. Uh, and then after theatre, he was sent to the ward. So he was reviewed on day one, day two post-op by the, uh, the surgical team uh, with the seniors moving around. Um, and there were no problems identified. Uh, he hadn't started eating or drinking yet. The surgeons had asked for him to be uh, NPO for a couple of days. So it was only towards the end of the second day when he was given some sips of water that some challenges started to happen. He wasn't, was unable to tolerate uh, drinking, was vomiting. His abdominal pain was getting worse. And now the last ward round had been on a Friday. So he was seen by the junior doctors on duty on Saturday, reviewed uh, who felt that he probably needed to go back to theater. Um, they were worried that the repair was leaking um, and they requested for that to happen. So the next bit of the story comes in on Monday when the surgical team move around and they see that his bed is empty um, and they don't know where he's gone. Uh, and when they try and find out what happened, they, they realise that the family came rushing to the nurse who was on duty overnight, uh, saying that he'd suddenly changed condition and he'd passed on in the middle of the night. Now, this story may resonate with some of you. Uh, this is uh, a story that happens uh, in, in a similar fashion across many hospitals in, in low resource settings, particularly across Africa. 
Um, and it's these patients that we really want to do something about. We have a challenge in surgery and anesthesia. There's, there's no specific money at the moment, no global fund allocated to, to uh, improving surgical and anesthesia and of course, obstetric care. Um, more than 4 billion US dollars allocated to HIV, malaria and TB. And that's despite the, 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 the big burden of surgical disease. Um, and the contribution of deaths around the time of surgery um, on a global scale. But not only is, is, is this a challenge and recognised on a global scale, but some of our very own work um, has, has told us, and by now everyone here I'm, I'm sure knows, that our patients in Africa are twice as likely to die, despite being younger and fitter, um, when compared with the global average. Um, and in the, the original ASOS study, most of the deaths, 95% of them occurred on the wards. Uh, and, and some of the words from that, uh, that original paper were that the thought that improved post-op surveillance would help to, uh, to reduce some of this mortality. So we talk about mortality a lot, but it's also important for us to focus on or think about um, complications. And so we uh, the, the the rates of complications between um, many settings around the world actually are very similar. Um, but if you look at the mortality rates following post-op complications, they can be up to twelve times higher. In in this this is data from of course the ASOS study, um, and that's quite astonishing. So we need to really understand what happens. We need to understand why our patients die after surgery, and this is when the concept of failure to rescue comes in. Uh, this, is, this is a diagram that helps to illustrate a little bit about what failure to rescue is. So we, a, a patient has surgery. Um, after the theatre, they go and undertake their post-operative care journey. And some of them will develop a complication. Now, ideally, that complication will be recognised and uh, the relative uh, the, the, the appropriate interventions will be started, the patient will recover and they'll be discharged from hospital. Sometimes those complications can get worse, um, but there's still another opportunity. Even when a complication gets worse, they can still be started on the correct treatment um, or sometimes they need an escalation in their level of care. They may end up in intensive care um, and then we end up uh, either improving and the patient recovering and going home or, or sadly the patient dies. And it's this patient or these groups of patients that develop complications um, who, who don't get better. They're our group where we talk about failure to rescue. In fact, failure to rescue was first described in uh, the 1990s. Um, and the factors that contribute to that were, were described uh, way back then, uh, poor escalation of care, uh, late recognition of, of the deteriorating patient, uh, challenges with communication of the deteriorating, pa deteriorating patient, uh, and then the response from senior or experienced members of the team and, and starting management. The reality, of course, is that um, failure to rescue is, is complicated, and we, we work in uh, a complex environment. And it doesn't matter if you work in a high-resource setting or a low-resource setting, um, I think a, any healthcare setting is complex because of the multitude of factors that can influence uh, outcomes of our patients. And so there are some patient level factors, uh, for example, co pre-existing comorbid disease, um, how, uh, how long the patient takes before they present to the hospital. Certainly my experience is that patients commonly present very late and that has a big impact on um, what we can do to, to uh, help to rescue them. Then there are also some uh, system factors, and uh, there was a very interesting study that looked at outcomes after, after cancer surgery that looked in a little bit more detail about some of these factors, and they attributed uh, about 60% of, of the, the reasons behind failure to rescue. They attributed it to some of the resources available within the hospital, the type of hospital, access to intensive care units, ask, ask, access to um, advanced imaging CT scanners. But even if you look in some, uh, some very similar hospitals, there can often be uh, big variations in the 
number of patients who develop complications who either go on and, and, and get better and go home or they, they deteriorate. And so those are not the only things that contribute to it. And there's the, there's the level of um, attitude, people's attitudes towards work, people's attitudes towards safety, uh, the culture. Uh, and so we can see here that actually failure to rescue and the reasons behind it uh, are, are very, very complicated. It's been suggested that failure to rescue could be used as uh, a measure of quality of care. And I think this is certainly something that's, that's very useful to think about. The, uh, the, of, of the six um, global indicators to look at uh, surgery and anesthesia care, uh, post-operative mortality rates are suggested as, as one of the important indicators. But of course, that doesn't take into account or reflect um, perhaps important patient characteristics, the type of surgery uh, that's happening. I can use a personal example because um, in my hospital, I often get involved as, as one of the only anesthesiologists. I get involved in quite complicated cases, the patients that are very sick. And so if you compared my uh, outcomes of my patients with the outcomes of, of one of our non-physician anesthesia providers who, who does a lot of the, the routine work, you'll see that my mortality rates are much higher. And so just looking at mortality rates uh, alone don't necessarily tell you, uh, tell you enough. Another, op uh, another option for looking at uh, quality of care, if you like, would perhaps be complications after surgery. But we shouldn't forget that complications are always going to occur. And I think it's fair for me to say that it would be impossible to prevent every complication after surgery. Um, but of course, uh, what happens after someone develops a complication and how we respond to that um, is very important. Failure to rescue, as, as I explained in the last slide, um, because it's such a complex, uh, complex topic, if we can look into it in more detail and perhaps understand what's happening, can allow us to, to look at the quality of care that we provide for the patients. Uh, but, but of course, these things are more challenging than they appear. Tracking complications, diagnosing complications, um, in, especially in settings where resources are, are limited, access to imaging and access to investigations is not always straightforward. Um, so although using failure to rescue and, and complications as measures of quality of care, it, it could be tricking in a low resource, tricky in a low resource setting. So I've talked a little bit about just in general failure to rescue, and I want to use uh, some specific examples of the work that we're, we're doing um, to illustrate how we might be able to use this failure to rescue concept to improve our uh, surgical care for our patients. Back in the very first uh, ASOS study, uh, I mentioned uh, that the post-op surveillance in hospitals was, was a problem and potentially contributed to the high mortality rates on the wards. Um, and this uh, audit data from a regional hospital in, in East Africa, which uh, also looks after a population of around 4 million people, showed that on some wards there were almost no or were no vital signs or observations done. Um, but on some of these same wards, there were uh, uh, almost 40 patients for one nurse. And so you can imagine when you have 40 patients who all need treatment, patients need admitting from theatre, patients need discharging home, um, it's easy to see how uh, some things that may not have an immediate impact on the care of the patient can get missed. Um, now, we, we, in my story at the beginning, I talked about the family members being the ones that brought the patients to the attention of the nurse when they deteriorated. Um, and I think this is a forgotten resource that we, uh, we should look at using more. Family members are commonly involved in patient care routinely. Um, things that perhaps in a high resource setting are, are done by nurses. The patients are washed, they're fed uh, by the family members. They're often around Certainly in my hospitals and many of the hospitals in Uganda, they're with the patients 24 hours a day. Um, they sleep on the wards. They have to go out and buy drugs and supplies when they're out of stock. Um, and so they contribute to the nursing care of, of their patients. Um, and so we realized this and we um, had read about some other examples in the literature where family members had been used to help support nursing care. 
um, a publication in, in Kenya where family members had been used to identify patients that needed senior review, um, family members monitoring patients with mild head injuries to avoid unnecessary hospital admissions. And so we wanted to test the idea of, of utilizing the family members to help us monitor our patients after surgery. So uh, we've, we carried out a small pilot trial uh, in a single center, family supplemented patient monitoring after surgery. And now this is a, this is a task sharing intervention. And so there was quite a lot of concern from the beginning, particularly through the, the, the ethics review process about relying on family members to take over one of the roles of the nursing staff. But of course, what we're, what we're doing is not taking over the roles. We're just supplementing the care that's already given um, and supporting the, the, the staff that are um, under pressure. And so over a period of, uh, of six months, we uh, ran a trial, a, a cluster randomized trial um, in one hospital, as I said, and we recruited 1,395 patients. And so over the four surgical wards, we, um, every ward had a baseline um, period where they, we just collected some baseline data. And then in turn, they were, um, they were started to, to, to run the intervention. And the intervention was training the family members to monitor basic vital signs. Uh, using a pulse oximeter to measure oxygen saturations and heart rate, and then teaching them how to measure the respiratory rate um, and the conscious level, and getting them to document that they'd done it on the on a chart, um, and teaching them in a very simple way when they were that the vital signs were outside a normal range. So, for example, above a, a heart rate of 130, then this was a danger sign, and they needed to go and notify the nursing staff. Now we uh, ran this study during COVID and so our patient population in the hospital varied a little bit uh, across the study because uh, during COVID when a lot of uh, Uganda had a very strict lockdown um, and so movement between districts was, was tricky. Most of our surgical work was obstetrics during that period. Um, and then as some of those um, rules were relaxed, we had uh, a slightly slightly lower proportion of obstetric cases. Um, but the key message from this is that it, it's feasible to involve the family members to help to monitor their patients. And there's a lot of uh, process evaluation data, very interesting qualitative data where family members would be helping uh, someone else in the next bed who didn't quite understand what to do. Um, patients who came to the end of their time in the study but who were still on the ward wanted to continue monitoring um, nurses who were training the family members uh, even though they'd not yet gone to surgery because they saw the benefit of it and there were 12 times more vital signs when family members were involved. So now we, we, we uh, I'm very passionate about uh, understanding what happens to our patients, uh, developing interventions that can be implemented and have a real impact. And of course, that's one of the, the big challenges of research. Um, it's relatively easy to run a research project, but when you come to translate the results of that and implement them into clinical practice on a much larger scale, uh, that's when it becomes trickier. But we have uh, we, we have a project with our collaboration um, with uh, five countries um, and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement to try and develop uh, and test an intervention to address failure to rescue. Uh, and we've called it the five R's to rescue. And I can just show you the five R's. So risk assessment, identifying our high risk patients, recognizing when they develop a problem, responding to that problem, reassessing so that we don't want to respond once, but we continually go back and, and recognize and respond as needed. And then reflecting as a team on what happens, um, both on the data that this, the intervention produces so we can improve, but also in terms of, of interprofessional morbidity and mortality meetings. Um, so I want to just tell you a little bit uh, more detail about each of the R's. Um, so risk assessment is important because that ratio of patients to nurses is overwhelming. And if we want to monitor our patients even 
more than twice a day in terms of vital signs monitoring, it's almost impossible if you want one nurse to look after 30 or 40 patients. But if you can identify your high risk patients and you ask them to focus on maybe three or four very sick patients, um, then it becomes much more feasible. And of course, with the success of, uh, of involving the family members, we want the family members to be involved and supported so that they can also help the nurses. So these patients are, are ideally go to a dedicated place. Now, this is a, a very nice picture of, of our surgical HDU when it first opened before any patients went in it. Uh, it doesn't look as clean and shiny as this now, but um, the idea is that you have a dedicated space for your high-risk surgical patients with access to the monitoring so that you can keep an eye on them. Of course, monitoring is, uh, is one thing, but you need to be able to recognize when the deterioration is happening. Um, and across our projects that we're, we're testing the use of different early warning scores, uh, a slightly easier vital signs directed therapy that came, came out of Tanzania, where you have simple cutoffs um, and any, any single one will trigger um, trigger an, act, an action. And then the news score, which uh, many of you will have know about. And so you, each vital sign is given a score and you add it up. And the aggregate score may or may not trigger um, an escalation of, of care. Um, and so there's very little information about how effective these are in our setting, in the low resource setting. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing is testing some of these things uh, and understanding how they can be implemented, which ones are most effective. And we do that using standards uh, at the moment, standard quality improvement methodology, um, BDSA cycles, regular data feed feedback like this run chart, um, which is just a simple chart to tell the team how well they're doing at identifying their high risk surgical patients, um, reg regular feedback of this data, and uh, discussion and learning across the, the sites and the countries that are um, involved. And the plan is that once we've developed an intervention that we think can work and we've tested it, um, we can then run a much larger trial where we collect good quality evidence that this uh, slightly complex intervention can work and reduce mortality across surgical patients. And I want to end by um, I suppose this is, a, this is a little bit of inspiration. Sometimes when you work in a low resource setting, you think that uh, high resource settings uh, are fine. They, they can manage to do all these things because they have lots more resources. But actually the challenges of, of changing clinical care, the challenges of implementing an intervention um, in an environment like a healthcare environment are, are, are not much different in a high income setting versus a low resource setting. Uh, these are two um, studies looking at implementation of, of a, a quality improvement initiative, if you like, trying to improve uh, care for surgical patients, one in the UK, um, and then ASOS 2, which was, uh, of course, across Africa. Um, and during the process of evaluation of those trials, some of the challenges that were identified um, preventing a, a big impact from being seen were very similar. Um, for example, getting your colleagues to change their practice. Very, very important, but also very, very difficult. Um, the people who are, who are here in this call who are enthousi enthusiastic about leading change, but trying to do that when you're also working a full-time job, you have limited time and very li limited organizational resources. Um, and so the challenges that we face uh, implementing some of the findings after, uh, after we have done the initial stages of research are very similar globally. Um, and uh, this, 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 I think, is most, I, well, I, I want to use this as a, an encouragement that it's not just the resources that help to do this. It's also the people and the collaborations um, and designing things so that they're, they're appropriate for the context that you're working in that will help us to be successful. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions that anybody has. Thanks, Adam. Uh, fantastic talk. And I think the order of the talks was superb um, because Luciana set the background, uh, which most of and the types of environments most of us are working in. 
I think, and then Luciana managed to highlight that really nice work by the NIHR Unit for Global Surgery on Priorities in Research, and um, number one being the post-op ward care, and um, and then that led really nicely to to your work, um, and especially with the role of the Smarter Project and thinking differently about how to address these these problems we all face. So I think um, I'd like to open it to the um, to the attendees for questions, and then we'll take it from there. Um, thank you so much, Luciana and Adam, for your excellent talks. Um, very inspiring work, and you're both working so hard um, to bring about the change um, that you're speaking about. Um, I was just thinking, um, you know, we, it, it, sometimes it's difficult for me to, you know, as, as a young researcher, to really consign the fact that, um, you know, what we learn scientifically uh, doesn't uh, penetrate into the way systems work and it, it penetrate into how our systems um, can function and how um, we often have to do a very simple things which are not necessarily highly scientific <laughs> like, you know like doing the blood pressure and heart rate on your patient post operatively and I was wondering if either of you um, could could speak into that, into that kind of uh, mental challenge that we have as clinicians sometimes, because we get taught in this very complex way, but actually the things that happen on the ground, what needs to happen is actually quite simple sometimes. Um, I don't know, I don't know if I'm oversimplifying it, but I was wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Costella. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting. And so my my I'm very interested in research, but I'm also very interested in just improving quality of care. Um, and some of the work I've been involved in in Uganda, uh, what I've really seen is that some of the biggest impact you can have in mortality is just providing good quality basic care. And that doesn't really need research. That just needs, okay, it needs a different type of research. And perhaps it's not your very scientific research, but it's it's about the implementation research. How do you change practice? So we already know some things, but how do you change practice in such a complex setting? Um, and and during this in our five hours to rescue project, we are learning so much about how how you can change, bring in new things based on evidence, but also how you can ensure they're sustainable and and people's practice change. Uh, it's complicated, um, but also very simple at the same time. If they can just do what they're supposed to do, it will be fine. <laughs> uh, yes, um, Christel, uh, thank you for uh, your question. Um, I'm very interested in the rational use of resources uh, also. And when you think about uh, a new technology implementation, uh, for example, uh, a new uh, cardiac output uh, device monitoring for transoperative, um, so, uh, during the transoperative. And uh, sometimes we do so much during the surgery and we don't look after uh, the patient uh, at the ward. So, um, and no sense for me to use so many technologies during the, 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 the surgical, as uh, the surgery and after um, we, don't, we don't have a routine, we don't, we leave the patient uh, at the ward. So this is not just for Brazil, but I, I'm sure it's uh, a rule for many countries. So like Adam uh, showed us, even the uh, uh, relatives can help in, in this kind of uh, monitoring. And 
I think we need to also um, have uh, economic analysis of these interventions. And we did an economic analysis of our intervention and the ward. And it was uh, cost effective because it, it was basically, uh, we increased the monitoring and we don't use any new technology and we reduce the outcome. So uh, we need to show that this is important and we need to uh, have people uh, with us and uh, it's hard because everybody's working and, uh, but we, we need to keep going because sometimes we have success in showing that we need uh, to increase the vigilance of the patients at the postoperative time. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Adam and Luciana. Um, so that I mean. Uh, thank you so much. Just I, I just want to say a huge thank you to, to both of you and to Bruce. But yeah, I think especially for Luciana, just giving us insights uh, to, to what's happening in your part of the world. So often we just think of where we are, even from a global surgery perspective, it's easy just to get so deep in this is what's happening around me. And, and it's great to also see that there's, there are similarities, but there are things that we can learn. And there's, you know, so I think I, I, I love the opportunity for collaboration with this. And then from, from Adam, also huge thank you from you as well. And I think the failure rescue to, to failure uh, to rescue concept is, you know, the tricky part is we know where the problem is but also that it's just such a systems issue. So it's, it's, it's important to marry the, the, the clinical aspects with the systems issues and, and hopefully we'll be able to, to find more successful interventions as we continue with all of this. But, and, and congratulations on the great work. Uh, you know, I think you shared a lot of insights on what you've done as well. So really appreciate that we can learn from your experiences. Thank you. Thanks, Adami. Um, Adam or Luciana, would you like to respond or should we move on to Patrick? Patrick? Okay, thank you again, uh, Richard, and thanks to the presenters, Luciana and Adam, for the great presentations, which actually fall very much in line with one thought piece that was published in The Lancet on the 9th of May this year, talking about surgical research uh, following from Cotton's comment of surgical research comic opera no more, which shows that there has been an improvement in surgical research, but there's still some more work to be done, especially to find the balance between the temptation of discarding the old effective practices for the new untested practices, but also on the methodology of our research, how we design the research and the methods we use. And of course, also being able to balance the statistical significance with the clinical significance, because sometimes as was noted, we tend to discard practice for statistical numbers, but when the clinical advantage to the patient is not very uh, obvious. I would like to hear the comments of the two previous presenters on such thoughts that were shared in this uh, editorial in The Lancet. Thank you very much. Uh, Luciana, would you like to go first? Yes, actually, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I didn't read the, this, the, this editorial, but uh, yes, uh, I agree that uh, 
we need uh, collaborative research and we need to find a way uh, to show that um, surgical uh, research is important in low middle income countries because um, um, I, uh, we need to strengthen the surgical system to strengthen the surgical, the, the, the health system. So I think uh, they are linked and uh, especially, for example, in Latin America, we have um, great uh, investment in infectious disease, I think in Africa also, but we don't have uh, investment in, in surgical uh, research. We don't have grants specifically for uh, surgical research. Uh, so uh, I think we need to uh, join efforts around the world and low middle income countries to improve research in, in this area. Uh, thanks, thanks, Luciana. Um, we, we've been behind, haven't we? Um, but there is uh, a movement that within surgery and, and anesthesia that's slowly picking up pace. Um, and uh, I actually, I saw the article on, on social media, someone tweeted about it. So I, I almost never look at the Lancet, but uh, social media is quite a powerful tool for sharing some of these very insightful pieces. Um, and we, I think the power of collaboration, like uh, Luciana is saying, is, is really key here. And so some of these very big studies that perhaps just come up with a, a single sentence, but the impact of that sentence uh, is huge, um, and ASOS is a good uh, a good example of that. And hopefully, LASOS will also um, provide similar insight to surgical care across Latin America. So, I, I, the power of our collaborative research that we're seeing more and more of um, probably will allow us to to get overtake infectious diseases and get ahead of them. They've done a lot of siloed research, people um, people working independently, and so I think. Give us 10 years and you may find that we are ahead. At least that's my aspiration. Oh, Adam, you said two things. So one I love and the other I didn't love. <laughs> uh, the one I love is um, uh, the challenge you've put out to us. Um, you know that we can, through the collaborative nature of our work, um, you know, surpass the infectious diseases group who have managed to get their narrative right. I'm not, I, I think, you know, all disease is important. I'm not saying it's less important, but where they have really um, outdone everyone else is they've managed to tell a story that resonates with people. And as a result, they get support. And really that's what we have to do. And we've got a very compelling story that we have to tell. The part um, <laughs> I didn't love was you said uh, something like, I don't read the Lancet or something. <laughs> so the, the people who can't read the Lancet, that's where we, we gotta go. We gotta, you know, aim high, go high and we we got to get our message in there. And so uh, that's another challenge to all of us. So I think those are the two things for me, which are super important. And I think, you know, as a group, I think we're all doing well. We're moving in the right direction, there's no doubt. I, d I know that we already over time. Are we allowed to carry on, Atani? Because it's uh, special to have this opportunity with Adam and Luciano if they're happy to chat a bit more. And I know Ravi is very keen to ask a question. I think we can continue for a bit longer. Thanks. Is it okay with you, Luciano and Adam? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay, great. Thanks. Ravi? Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for a great uh, session. And here, yeah, just a couple of observations and questions. Uh, so I've been, my passion has been around perioperative care and optimizing patient care in the perioperative period, and I've been involved with a few pilot projects. And what the first question is about positioning research that is relevant to everyone. 
in the perioperative space, especially policymakers. We tend to position our research from a clinician or patient base. And I think that maybe one of the reasons we struggle with getting traction of scaling up. And that's been my personal experience. And I'd love to hear from the speakers what their experience has been from that aspect. And the second just talks to a little bit of what Christelle was uh, alluding to is that a lot of what we need to do is fairly basic in the perioperative period, but we don't do it. We don't do it for a variety of reasons. And one of the key reasons is the fact that we don't know what we should be doing because the evidence has changed so much. So what is your experience in implementing change in perioperative care across a perioperative MDT in your hospitals from teaching and training in particular of nurses, uh, doctors, physiotherapists, dietitians, et cetera. Thank you. Well, um, I can start. I can say that uh, uh, implementation, uh, any uh, quality improvement and implementation uh, is a complex intervention. Uh, if we look at the ERAS program, they have more than 20 uh, uh, measures that we need to, to address in the preoperative setting. And we don't know exactly what are the, the, uh, the measures that are uh, uh, responsible by the, the, the outcomes. So uh, it is difficult. So any, any uh, implementation needs time and I think we need to uh, make it easier. Um, I know the 5R uh, program that Adam uh, showed, I, uh, I had the opportunity to, to look to this. Uh, and it's, uh, the idea is to uh, have a, an intervention that is easy for everybody. Everybody can uh, understand and apply but we need time to train the teams and we need continuous training. This is a problem. We had a success in, in the implementation of a pathway for the high-risk surgery, surgical patients in our hospital. But after the pandemic, we couldn't resume the, 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 the project in, in uh, because of we need to train everybody again and people were not motivated and we have several problems. And this is an example. We know what we need to do sometimes and we don't have stakeholders or we don't have uh, uh, people uh, involved. So uh, it is a, a problem when we depend on uh, many processes to implement some, some kind of change. And I think all these perioperative interventions have this, uh, this kind of challenge. I don't know if Adam agree. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and I think this is, this is when the comment about uh, policy comes in because um, I suppose research is like a spectrum um, and you can ask your quite scientific question and you get some scientific numbers that tell you whether or not it can work. But when you come to think about how you implement that, um, understanding how it fits into the, the, gov the, the country or the government's priorities um, is very important. Uh, we're, we're starting our National Surgical Obstetric and Anesthesia Plan in Uganda. Um, and so hopefully over the next eight to 12 months, we'll, we'll come up with a plan as a country, but um, understanding the priorities um, and also helping the policymakers to understand what, what surgical care is um, and what the gaps are, I think is key. And so we also need that data at a national level, at, a, at the, the data that means something to the policymakers. Perhaps is another type of research, but is equally as important if we want our research to have an impact. Um, and so as we're designing questions, we need to think to think about the data that we're collecting and how we're going to measure that impact um, so that we can ensure it has, uh, has the impact we want it to. Uh, 
at the end. Uh, Lucian and Adam and Ravi, um, I'd just like to make one comment. Um, I think what what we've all learned over the last few years is that even to do the simple things is um, it's going to take quite a lot of effort and work. You know, we we thought we could circumvent that by um, doing something simple with Athos too, but uh, it was it didn't work. Um, uh, we learned a lot of it, and I think Luciana's experience where she had success in a single but very big hospital, which came unstuck when you know the teams changed and everything shows that it's a real because the surgical space and particularly once you're outside of the control of the operating room is very complex but we you know we have to work hard together um, to try and navigate the complexity and try and get people aligned if we're going to even be able to do the simple things correctly and i know ravi comes from a background uh, of ERAS, and they've certainly set a really good example on how to, you know, improve surgical outcomes through um, very defined interventions and organization, but ERAS in itself uh, requires a lot, um, a lot of stakeholders to be very aligned, a lot of feedback, you know, like very good in, uh, principles but it also demands resources to be able to do that. So we've got a big challenge, I think, for all of us going forward. Uh, Super Siso. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you, uh, Luciana and Adam, for uh, such a great talk. Um, I think, Adam, you've already uh, sort of touched on what I actually wanted to ask, which is, you know, it, I think with all, all the challenges that we have, and, and Bruce, you've also mentioned this, that we try and um, create individualized um, means to, to get over the problems and these small scale pro um, uh, solutions, uh, you know, for the benefit of the patient. But, you know, really in the long run, it does require the policymakers, the big stakeholders, middle management, upper management to really, um, get on board with these things. And I just wanted to ask um, what has been your experience in terms of presenting, you know, the stats and presenting what is actually needed in the hospitals to circumvent failure, um, to resuscitate patients. What has your, your experience uh, been? Because, we, it, I mean, the reality is we can do so much. We can have so many staff or so many SATS monitors or so many patients sitting in the front, but really in reality, we need better high care settings, better staff, et cetera. So what has your experience been in terms of, you know, presenting this to middle upper management? Um, yeah. Uh, so maybe, uh, maybe let me go first. Um, I think so. What I've, from my experience, what I've seen is is often um, people at a higher level are not given data. Often, uh, some of the decision making or a lot of the decision making is not based on good quality data. Um, and so, uh, when you come and you you have data to present that gives them a picture of what's happening, then they're very interested and very happy with that. Um, implementing higher levels of care is is very challenging because everything that goes with it um uganda spent a huge amount of money on intensive care units in the press you'll read we have uh, 10 icu beds in every regional hospital but of course the reality is that most don't have specialists uh, we don't have piped medical air we don't have piped oxygen all those things um but there are some uh, basic processes of care that that can be done um, and so I think the, the easiest way at our level to produce change is to make sure that research and data is included in the agenda so that people are, are, are understanding what's happening. And then very slowly, things will change. Um, if we try and make change without the data, then it's going to be very difficult. 
Um, but if we can ensure that uh, research in surgery and anesthesia obstetrics is a priority for governments and policymakers, um, be it epidemiological data or, or interventions, then I think we will um, slowly be able to improve the, the care that the patients get. Yes, um, <clears throat> I agree uh, with Adam. And also we, uh, we are discussing uh, for a long time that we need to show some data to move forward uh, to other levels. So people need to believe that we have the problem and that we have some uh, solution uh, to address the problem. Uh, for, uh, for example, um, we worked with then uh, 10 uh, data from 10 hospitals, public hospitals and private hospitals. And we find uh, a difference in mortality between the, the public and the, the private hospitals. And, and this is a, a, a difficult data to show to our uh, Ministry of, of Health because um, we have differences uh, how we treat patients in the public and private system. So now uh, we need to, uh, to take care how we will show this uh, data, but we need to understand more about the process of care in each system. So uh, we need to start to, to, to study this difference, but first we show that we have difference. So uh, I think it's a, a one thing is linked to other. We need to start with observational studies to show that we have the problems, where the problems are, and we need to go to interventions. So people believe when we have numbers. I think it's, uh, it's a rule. I think um, it's probably a good place to um, conclude the meeting. Uh, at, at, I think uh, Luciana's summary is correct in that we know, like, it, just uh, the power of the message we got from ASOS has led to an interest in trying to make a difference in the sort of post operative period in Africa. Uh, and we've subsequently done other work, which is providing information for things to do in the future. And Luciana's got a massive network now who's starting to generate uh, data from Latin America, which will provide guidance, I think, for where they need to intervene or where they can look to make a difference. So I think, you know, in, in different types of surgeries, we're in different places and in different regions in the world, we're also in different places. But I think, you know, show, show the evidence and then look for the signals and then systematically try and address them. Um, I must say, it's really been a real privilege to be able to chair the meeting today. Luciana and Adam, you are inspirational people. Um, your talks were fantastic. And it's, yeah, it's been a great uh, lunchtime for me, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the courage of your work and what you're doing. And thanks so much for sharing your time with us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, Bruce.